Father, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy. Establish us in you, Father. And we continue to give you praise, glory, worship for all that you are. As we enter into your presence, O oh God, of your word, we pray, Father, once again, that the spirit of wisdom and revelation would enlighten our hearts and minds that the eyes of our understanding will be flooded with light, that we may see all of the hope of your calling, the riches of your inheritance in the saints, and the exceeding greatness of your power towards us who believe. We praise you, we worship you, we glorify you, Lord. And we thank you that you're here in our midst. And as your word is ministered, cause us to hear your word with the ears of our spirit, not just the ears of our natural mind and body. Cause, so, Father God, that you would stretch forth your hands to manifest Jesus in our midst, that we would receive from you your giftings, the power and working of your spirit and touch and bring healing, bring wholeness and bring transformation to our heart, our lives and our mind. For all that you do, Father, we give you the glory, the worship and the honour. For to you, Father, and unto Christ it all belongs. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone say, Amen. Praise God, we are on a series on the love of God, and uh, we want to look at the Gospel of John this afternoon, and see how important it is to grow in the love of God. In the Gospel of John, chapter 15, Jesus tells his disciples in verse 5, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Now this is a section where Jesus emphasized on fruit. Every one of us, when we're in Christ, we need to bear fruit in some manner. In fact, he tells us in the previous verses, if you read from verse 1 to 4, Jesus declares, I am the true vine and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in a vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. And then he spoke, John chapter 15, verse 5, where he's a vine with a branch. Everyone who abides in him, we bear much fruit. The word much is abundant fruit. <coughs> Obviously, every one of us must bear fruit. And we realize that the definition of fruit needs a bit of explanation. Because in some places, in some churches, there's so much emphasis on discipling or converts, <coughs> such that if you didn't bring anyone to the Lord, or you didn't bring other disciples, then you're considered fruitless. <coughs> we need to look at fruit in two areas. Of course, there are fruit in the lives of the people around us, not necessarily converts. If our lives affect another life for the better, or change them, or transform them, that is a fruit. Of course, involved in that transformation could be you could bring people to the Lord, and you bring them closer to God, and those who are already in the Lord, you bring them even closer to your life and your walk with God. So you have bring them into a closer uh, relationship with God. So that is your fruit. Those are your fruit to a certain extent. Uh, people, in other words, uh, the effect of people around us and our life, how we affect our, everyone around us, including our loved ones and family and friends or those of your associates. But the other fruit is our personal fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance. Uh, Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23. So those are different fruit. 
And if you look at this statement and uh, this passage, there are only these two choices you have on fruit. It's either the fruit that is a result from your life in the lives of other people, or the fruit that you yourself bear in your own personal transformation in God. Whichever direction it is, one is what I call the vertical direction. Uh, a vertical direction, and that is you and God. You progress in God, and you grow to be more like God. You produce all the fruit of the Spirit. And of course, the fruit of the Spirit can be summarized in love. And if you compare Galatians 5, verse 22, 23 with 1 Corinthians 13, that all the other aspects of the fruit of the Spirit, including uh, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, can be found through love. Love endures, love suffers long, and all those aspects, it all rests in love. So you grow in love. Growing in love or grow in joy, peace, and every other fruit. Uh, they, they flow forth from love. When the fruit of the Spirit, although nine different qualities are mentioned, they all come from one substance, the love of God. All of them can be summarized in the love of God. Because inside love, there's peace. Inside love, there's joy. Inside love, there's long-suffering. Inside love, there's temperance. Inside love, there are all the qualities of the fruit of the Spirit. So there is vertical fruit in God. We can summarize it in one statement. Growing in love. Growing in the love of God. And in your love for people. The horizontal relationship could be you walk in God and you disciple others, you influence others, you teach others, you nurture others, you care for others. And you disciple them, you bring converts to Christ, you bring people to the Lord, or you operate the gifts of the Spirit and they are fruit. All the gifts of the Spirit, mind you, is supposed to be operated by love. You take away love, all the gifts have no power and effect. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that. That if you speak in tongues but you don't have love, you are just a cleansing symbol. And all the other gifts, whether they be uh, healing gifts and prophetic gifts, all the other gifts must flow through love. And it says without love, even give of charity, you can give your body to be burned and give all you have without love, you are nothing. So apparently, all the gifts of the Spirit, remember 1 Corinthians 13 is placed between 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 14 talks about ministries in the church and all the various functions or offices. And sandwiched between them is love. So love was a theme that was brought forth in 1 Corinthians 13 in talking about the gifts of the Spirit functioning. He says, I show you a better way. So he talks about the gifts of the Spirit and says, this is how the gifts of the Spirit can flow powerfully. And so when you talk about horizontal relationship, they would be the product of love through your life in other lives. And I believe even you operate a gift of prophecy or a word of knowledge or a gift of healing or working in miracles, it is the love of God that flows through your life, through His compassion, you minister the gift and then it brought forth an indication of his love. God heals because he loves. God brings us a word of knowledge because he loves us and wants to reveal things to us. God reveals a prophetic gift because he loves us and wants us to establish our life in him. God brings to us a, uh, different uh, aspects of discerning of spirits to show us a spiritual gem because he loves us. Everything flows from his love. And the difference is that the horizontal, horizontal fruit can be seen not in just your life, it can be seen in the lives of others around you. You can tell who a person is by the people around them whom they transform or influence. And of course, we pray that you be the influencer and not the person being influenced by the world. And that is the horizontal fruit that 
to many churches or to many ministries, they emphasize especially on that a lot because they just want to count the numbers. And uh, that's not good enough. Numbers are the result and should not be the aim. Nowhere in the Bible do they just aim at numbers. They just aim at the Lord and everything was a side effect, including numerical growth. And so in each one of our lives, we should not be pressured to try to reproduce ourselves or to disciple another. All this must be by the leading of the Lord. But we can summarize to say there must be fruit. There must be fruit. Whether it be horizontal fruit or vertical fruit, there must be fruit in our lives. Without the fruit of love, we are not growing. Thus, we can ask the question, from year to year, month to month, have we borne fruit? Which means that if from last year to this year, you have not grown either vertically or horizontally, you have backslidden. Life is a growth. We have to be growing. Now, this is a fair statement provided we allow for vertical growth besides horizontal growth. Now, how do the two go together? Look at Jesus himself. What is Jesus' standard? Jesus says that if a branch in him, in verse 2, does not bear fruit, he takes away. And then the branch in him that bears fruit also got pruned. So how is Christian growth measured? Why are we teaching this series on love? Because we have to have a measurement by which we measure our growth. And a lot of people have different measurements. They measure growth by how many people you could win to Christ a year. No, that's not a good measurement. They measure by your knowledge in the Bible. No, although good, but no, not good enough. And they measure by maybe what they're doing, how active they are. No, that's not a good measurement. All these are not good measurement. The best measurement of our growth is in our vertical relationship and its side effect on the horizontal. Now, the two are important, which means that if next year you don't have more love than this year, you haven't grown. You have stunted. And if 10 years from now, we have not grown in our love, then we haven't grown. It says fruit. We have to firstly define fruit. And I have summarized the definition of fruit as love. Love towards God and towards all. Love produced in a life of other people. And so Christian life is not like a... Uh, a graph which goes at a 45 degree angle all the way up. It's not a straight line that climbs at a 45 degree angle. Christian life is not like that. Christian life is more like steps. And uh, we grow like steps. You grow vertically, then you grow horizontally. Then you grow vertically, then you grow horizontally, then you grow vertically, then you grow horizontally. Christian life in its perfect state is more like steps going up. We always have to grow vertically before we grow horizontally. Because the fruit that we produce is produced from the inside out. And so we need to grow from the inside first before we grow on the outside. And this growth, where the love of God that grows in our life can grow in different measures. What is this growth in love? Let me point to several things in the Bible here. One is John chapter 1 where it says here in the Gospel of John chapter 1 
verse 16. And of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. Talking about certain level of growth. Grace upon grace. Grace against grace. And here we have in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. I'd like to put all these verses together. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. One level of grace to another level of grace. One level of glory to another level of glory. Grace to grace, glory to glory. So there is a progression in glory, there is a progression in grace, there is a progression in the love of God. Ephesians chapter 3, in Ephesians 3, we see here in Paul's prayer for the church, in verse 16, he says, he prays that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Notice how much relationship we have with the love of God. In verse 17, rooted and grounded in love. Verse 19, to know the love of Christ. See, this is all relationship we have with God and His love. And of course, we know that Bible verse in 1 John chapter 4 that tells us God is love. Because in 1 John 1, it says God is light. God is light. God is love. So people wonder, what is God like? God is love. And when you can comprehend that love, which is beyond comprehension, when you experience this love, you are experiencing God. The very substance of God. Now, think about the phrase, God is light. It means that all light produced is by Him. The spiritual world, even the natural world, when we look out into the stars and into the darkness of the stars and the natural galaxy, everything is dark except where the stars are and our own sun. The light that we can see with our natural eyes is the light from the sun and the light from the stars. And all these inventions of man are just tapping indirectly or directly all the energies of the sun that has flown and given life and energizing upon this planet Earth. In the spiritual world, there is only one source of light, God. All light produced and is issued from Him. And all the angels that are bright are only bright because they reflect and refract. To reflect is outwardly. To refract is for it to go through you and come out. So God's light is reflected and refracted through the angels to us. That's why we see them as shiny, bright and brilliant. And our spirit man, as it grows in God, gives out light. Because that light was the little life 
that God gave to us when He breathed life into us. Our spirits were not created. They were birthed and imparted. Spirits are never created. Spirits are imparted. God impart life and distribute His life through. That's where our light comes from. When God is light, all the sources light, everything you see that is light came from a reflection or a refraction of that light, the origin of God. Now, having understood that statement, God is love. Everything that has any semblance of pure, true love is a reflection and a refraction or other flowing through of that love. No one can love except through that love of God. When we feel love, it's when we are feeling God. Think about it this way. It is never our love because we are never capable of love. All love has a source. Remember the Bible says, God is love. It implies every source of love is God. Just as we say, God is light. He's the light of all the universe. God is love. And all that is love. And people wonder, what is the presence of God like? Now, God is light and God is love is related. It's related. Which is why in our fatherly talks, if you've been receiving, our last one we mentioned was, the love of God is the glory of God. The two are one. Because the glory of God comes forth from the light of God. And the love of God comes from His very being and nature. The two are equal and the same. See, in the Bible, the glory of God is a powerful thing. We see in the book of, uh, of uh, Exodus, when Moses desired God, and Moses saw the glory of God, Moses said, show me your glory. And when he saw the glory of God, his face was transformed. He came down in Exodus 34 with his face lighted up like a light bulb. And then at the end of Exodus chapter 40, when he dedicated the temple, the whole temple was filled with the glory of the Lord. And many times we picture the glory of God like a cloud covering the whole place. Not an ordinary cloud. Bright, brilliant cloud. White, brilliant. Covering the whole place. So much that the Bible says, Moses could not enter into the cloud. Did it say that in the Bible, Exodus chapter 40? See, even the man who has seen God's glory to so many dimensions, when that glory came and filled the temple, in Exodus 40, it says here that in verse 34, the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Verse 35, Moses was not able to enter couldn't go in. Even him who saw God's glory, the back parts of God's glory, could not go in. Take with the presence of God. You remember what God said about His glory? When Moses said, show me your glory in Exodus 33, no man can see my glory and live. Wow, that's God's glory. And He says, Moses, I will show you the back parts of my glory. And we remember the glory of God when they dedicate the temple, fill the temple of Solomon. Such is the glory of God. So powerful, so wonderful. And the reason why the Ark of the Covenant itself was so powerful, not because of the piece of furniture that it was. It was a piece of furniture until the presence of God came upon it. And it became the semblance or representation of God's presence the Ark of the Covenant, the glory of God. Oh, the glory of God is a wonderful thing. 
And people have experienced the manifestation of the glory of God at different times, at different places. And Jerry Savell uh, spoke about once in the, his meeting one time when he was praying in a hotel room and the presence of God was so strong, people trying to get into the room and they could not because uh, they felt a barrier, they couldn't get in. And so one pastor, you know, said, wow, this presence was strong and he's so eager to get in. So he pushed, couldn't get in. So he ran from a distance. Yeah. Uh, Thinking, you know, based on science and you know, how much pressure you can push is based on your velocity and your weight. So he ran. He ran. He hit the present, bounced off, fell backwards. And in the end, they came out of the presence. You know, they say, hey, what's happening? He said, hey, we couldn't get into the room. And the other New Zealand pastor, my, my friend, uh, Pastor Lal is in New Zealand, one of the two churches that we, we visited. Uh, Pastor Lal is a, a Maori and he's a worshipper of God. He says a worship, worship. He loves to worship. And he told me about uh, this incident when uh, one of the leading Christian Maori leaders died. And he was there leading the worship somewhere up north in, uh, uh, in the North Island in New Zealand. And so, he was in this house and they were singing and worshipping and he was just leading that worship. Um, the, uh, there were workers outside because it's a major funeral service. The workers outside, uh, laborers, heard a tremendous sound. Sound. Loud sound. Probably thunderclap or whatever. And then they came running to the place where they were in a house. And he didn't know about it. They inside, they're just worshipping God. And uh, the, in the end, uh, when the workers came and they tried to get in, they could not get in. There was some force, a power that prevented them from going in. And then later on, when they came out for that and the workers came through the back door, and they said, hey, what's uh, happening? They said, we heard a sound and we came to check out what is this sound. And uh, they said, there's an invisible power that we cannot cross. All these are tangible manifestations of God's glory. Now, all this glory, tremendous though it was, we need to look at the essence of this glory. What was it actually? The glory of God is the love of God. That's the New Testament revelation. Even in the Old Testament, you find when God says, I will show you my glory in Exodus 33. And then God, when He came down and His glory actually came, you know what the Lord talked about? Mercy, long-suffering, kindness, love, attributes of love. Because love and glory are related. And even if you find it hard to uh, ascribe, you say, wow, theologically having the glory of God equal to love is a tremendous thing. Think about it in this simple terms of 1 John 4. When John says God is love in the Greek, esteem is, it is the same as saying love is God. Now think about God. And all his attributes, it's equal to love. When you say God, there's all the attributes, not one quarter of God, not one bit of God, not one attribute. All of God is love. Every fiber of God's being is love. And the key to the glory of God in the New Testament is the love of God. That is why if you look over with me to the book of 2 Corinthians, as he describes the manifestation of God in our life, he says here in 2 Corinthians, Second Corinthians, and he described 
The New Testament in these terms, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. It says, If the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glorious countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? We have the potential of having it more glorious. And look at what has happened. It tells us here in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, For it is God who commanded light, light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Can you see that statement? That statement, long statement means God has put a part of His light and glory in our hearts, correct? He has given us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, what is the knowledge about? It's the knowledge of the glory of God. That means we know and we understand something about the glory of God. Now, when did this take place? When we were born again. Then when you look at Romans chapter 5, what happened when we were born again? In Romans 5, Romans chapter 5. It says here in verse 5, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So can you see? The same incident described in Corinthians as the light of God shining in our hearts, giving knowledge of the glory of God, that Romans described as the, as the love of God poured into our hearts. Same event. Same event taking place. Because the glory of God and the love of God are the same thing. Now that knowledge of the glory, it's a powerful knowledge. Which means that if we want to handle the greater parts of God's glory, we must handle the greater parts of God's love. That's the secret. To grow more in love, and then you see the combination of both in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Which tells us here, in Ephesians 3, in Paul's prayer, in verse 16. And you see glory and, and love interchange. In Ephesians 3 verse 16 that He would grant you according to the riches of what? Of His glory. Can you declare with me? Of His glory. Say, according to the riches of His glory. Thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> your food is sure very heavy on you. <laughs> Of his glory, and it's talking about his glory. According to the riches of his glory, he grants us to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that us we being rooted and grounded in love. Again, it turns into love. As if love and glory are interchangeable. You're strengthened based on His glory and you're rooted in His love. So that you could know His love 
And so that you could be filled with the presence of God, which is again the glory of God. You see, the interchangeability that He makes on the glory and the presence of God in our life. Thus, we all need to grow and enter the place of His presence. Now, I hope that helps you because many people, they, they, they ask this question. What is the presence of God like? So some people say, oh, when the presence of God comes, I get these tingles. <laughs> now, that's a side effect. Because there are a lot of pe people who got tingles, but it's not the presence of God. They gather around, talking about camp, they gather around the campfire, and they tell ghost stories. <laughs> so you get a tingle, but different, different spirit. <laughs> Wrong spirit. So, some people say, oh, the presence of God, when He comes, you know, I get this hot sensation. <laughs> but that is not the presence of God. That is a side effect. All these are okay. It's different side effect. And so some people say, the presence of God, when it comes, sometimes in the same meeting, one person say, oh, the presence got so hot. Oh, oh. And another person say, oh, so cool. You know, oh, so cool, like water flowing. Say, why? One hot, one cold. You know? What's wrong with us? Very rare cases. I know, very rare. But once in a while, some people sense the presence of God very different. I know some people, and they say, oh, the presence of God is there. And they say, this cold sensation. I say, wow, you're very unique. <laughs> Most people, warm, cold, tingling, shaking, you cold like ice. I say, Most of the time, it's the devil. <laughs> it's cold sensation. Then there was one very racket, and that person, I believe there was a certain healing taking place. Don't know what's going on in that person's body or sensation. But all these are side effects. These are not the measurement for the presence of God. Because if it's really true that those are the presence of God, then you better go and tingle more. <laughs> that means if you tingle like that, the presence of God is like that. So you tingle like that, more, even more powerful. <laughs> Might as well shake your whole body in the presence of God. No? That's all a side effect. The real presence of God is His love. Deep, because God is love. Deep in the presence of God. If I were to ask Pastor Lau, what was it like to be inside when you're worshipping and the people couldn't get in? The love of God. The worship of God. The presence of God. It's that presence. Now, when you think about God and His deep presence, think about the most awesome sensation of love. That's what the presence of God is like. From time to time, we touch into that presence. But there is a place in God where we can experience that. Where God desires us to dwell in. It's a place where you experience what Ephesians 3 tells us. You know why Ephesians asks us in this manner? He says, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. Because we cannot contain all of the love of God. Like the song says, the old hymn that says, Though every man were a scribe, and every quill on earth, uh, 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 every feather or whatever thing was a quill on earth, a pen, and the, the whole ocean is ink, and the sky was a scroll, to write the love of God would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the sky contain the love of God. That's how much God's love is. And Ephesians 3 says, we can carry God's love in proportion to the strength of our inner man. This in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3, it tells us that our inner man must be strengthened. It says, your inner man be strengthened. So we can say that all of us 
are containers of God's glory and love. But how much love, the love of God, not our own love, how much of the love of God and the glory of God we can contain is directly proportional to the strength of your inner man. So if your inner man be very skinny, then the love of God can be skinny. And that's why it results in stingy, <laughs> micro. Because the love of God, your inner man very weak. And as our inner man grows, it can contain more of the glory and the love of God. Thus, our inner man needs to be here, strengthened. Strengthened. We cannot take all of God's glory. Glory upon glory, grace upon grace, faith unto faith. So the love of God is deposit. Remember I say it's like steps. Vertical first, you got to strengthen you, so vertical growth. And then, we reach a certain point, horizontal growth, because you need to give up. You need to be able to give up. Part of learning to love is to love others. So there's vertical growth, and then you want to grow some more. You say, God, give me more. Oh, Lord, I want more of your love. More of your love. And then God really pour his love, pour his love. But then he reached a point, cannot receive anymore. You know what we need to do? We need to start giving out through our life. And that's why in the gifts of the Spirit, in the working of God, in anything, if it be teaching, prophesying, or whatever area, unless you start giving out in proportion to your faith, you cannot grow some more. So it reach a point of saturation, we need to be able to bring it forth. That's where the horizontal growth starts. You read vertical growth, horizontal growth. And then vertical fruit, horizontal fruit again. And there will always be that pattern all over in our life. And, and that is why sometimes God calls us into His chamber. Some of us, you'll be very effective in God. Horizontal expansion of your life, your ministry, you know, you've been effective everywhere, you're influencing others, you've got a lot of fruit of every kind in your life. Horizontal. You're growing and you're growing, but you reach a certain stage where you start drying up. What did Jesus say in John 15? When you bear fruit, He will prune you so that you bear more fruit. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. So there is a place where as you have grown and produced fruit, Jesus will call you and say, come, come to Him again. And as the call to come, and that's not easy because nobody likes pruning. Now, when He prunes us, it's not because we've got some problems. He says, those who bear fruit, that means nothing wrong with them. He prunes. And pruning is not very nice because if anyone of you seen a plant that is pruned in uh, overseas, uh, most of the pruning is done in winter time when, and, uh, and uh, a lot of people prune their plants down. And when a plant is pruned, it can be a nice, big, lovely plant. And then they prune it, it looks like it just had a crew cut. <laughs> Which some of you may have been pruned. <laughs> right? And, uh, so, it's pruned completely. It doesn't look nice. Imagine, you're like a plant and you're grown in God and Jesus said, come over here. <laughs> and you go there and there are the angels with the shears. And he starts cutting you, chopping all your branches. Ah, ah, I tell you, pruning is painful. If you could hear the plant, plant cry, you would hear the loudest when they are pruned. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. Thank God the plant doesn't scream so loud. <laughs> pruning is not something nice, but it's something necessary. Because we need vertical growth again in order to produce more. And this place 
that God calls is vertical, vertical and horizontal, vertical, until He, and most of the time, while we are growing there, it's mainly because He's trying to reveal to us the fullness of His love. Look at Ephesians 3. The purpose is that in verse 17, Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we've been rooted and grounded. Yes, you may have love, but are you rooted and grounded? And it tells us here that we may comprehend with all the saints what is the width, length, depth, height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. And this place of love where God brings us into, in the end, He wants to position us to taste the fullness of that love. What is that position? It's the secret place of the Most High God, which in Ephesians chapter 2, is tied up to the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. And we know was. 5, 6, 7, right? We, we know verse uh, uh, five, 5 and 6. It says in verse 5 and 6, which we actually touched on last night, it says, Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, He raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See, that's you and I. We are all seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And do you know that verse 4 and 5 is sandwiched by verses about love? Look at verse 3. God, who is rich in mercy. Now, whenever you see rich in mercy, your, your interpretation must cover glory and love. Because during the times that God revealed His glory, mercy is always mentioned. When God revealed His glory unto Moses in Exodus 33, He proclaimed He's a God full of mercy, long-suffering. And you know what the singers and musicians were singing? What title was their song when they were singing at the dedication of the Temple of Solomon? You remember what song they were singing? What was the title? It was not How Great Thou Art. <laughs> what was the title of the song that they were singing at the dedication of the temple in 2 Chronicles chapter 5? Very simple words. The Lord is good and His mercy endures forever. See, not a very sophisticated, long song. Just a simple song that they were singing. The Lord is good and His mercy endures forever. The Lord is good and His mercy endures. They were enjoying the mercy of God, the goodness of God. And the glory of the Lord came. So they were saying, the Lord is good and His mercy endures forever. The Lord is good and His mercy endures forever. Then the glory of God came. Zoom, and then they still say, the Lord is good and His mercy endures forever. Because He still is good and His mercy still endures forever. The mer- when you see the word mercy, it is tied to the glory of God and the love of God. And here we have, it says, the Lord who is rich in mercy because of His, what love? Do you see your words there? Okay, I can't hear you. Can you shout it out? Oh, that's too soft. What do you say? Small love? Little love? Tiny love? So, so love. (laughs) Great love. Now, why why does the Bible express great love at this point? Because of His great love, He raises up. He raises up to 
the heavenly places. Now, some of you picture the heavenly places, well, all the very official in the throne room. God the Father, Jesus the Son, you're all seated with Jesus, all quite quiet. Don't dare to move. Tiny move, lightning strike you. Die. <laughs> what is it to be seated? I mean, would you like to be seated in the heavenly places in Christ in that kind of situation? You know, there are some expressions in the Bible that are very strange. Remember the one in uh, uh, Revelations, you know, about those who overcome. And among time, the blessings of the overcomers was he will make you a pillar in the house of God. <laughs> I pray that blessing for some of you. <laughs> Imagine, he made you a pillar in a temple in the house of God. You know, remember all this figurative. Surely God is not going to take you and then say, okay, you're going to remain here for the next 10 quadrillion years. <laughs> a pillar in the house of God. And don't move, you move, you die. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> He's going to make you a pillar in the temple of the house of God <laughs> uh, forever. That's an expression about some close relationship with Him. So here the expression, being seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know, what, what does it mean? Is it just sit there? Eyes also cannot move. Because why too powerful, throne room, move or die. <laughs> you know? So you're actually kya kya. You know? And heaven got no toilet, so don't do all the funny thing, you know. So and uh, so you're scared. No. The, the place or the heavenly place is actually a place of ultimate love. It's a place where God showers you with His love and let you experience this awesomeness of His love. What kind of love? The same love that He loved Jesus with. Oh, that's a powerful place to be. You see, Jesus prayed that prayer in the book of John chapter 17 in his prayer. He says here, and that was before he went to the cross. In John 17, he, he asks of the Father, he says, and I read part of his prayer. He says in verse uh, 22, John 17 verse 22, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. Now you know why that glory is love, because only that glory can make us one. And only the love of God can make us to be one in Him. And then verse 23, I in them, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one that all the world, that the world may know you have sent me and have loved them, not love me, love them as you have loved me. Wow! That place that Jesus says is the place of glory. It's the place where you experience all the fullness of the love that God has flowing to Jesus that flows to you. Not love Jesus, God really loved Jesus. He says that they may be made perfect in one that the world, the world can see that you have sent Jesus and that you love them, that the world can see that we are love of God. That we are the disciples whom Jesus loved. Wow, what a nice title. John took that title in the Gospel of John, you know, at the Lord's Supper. John says, you know, when Jesus says something, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Peter had to ask, can you check with Jesus whom he meant when he says one of us will betray him? <laughs> why didn't Jesus ask Jesus? Why didn't Peter ask Jesus? Why didn't Peter ask Jesus? Jesus was right there. 
and the disciple whom Jesus loved. <laughs> disciple whom Jesus loved, you know, he was uh, just leaning onto it. Hey, James, Jesus, you know, oh Jesus, this is wonderful, you know. And Peter was not leaning there, and Peter, you know, he was whispering, can you check with Jesus whom you said who will betray him? <laughs> he was already leaning on Jesus' bosom, right? So, the ear of the one leaning and the ear of Jesus, how far is the distance? <laughs> Why don't you just whisper in Jesus' ear? Because maybe Peter is Singaporean, kia 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 su. You know, don't dare to ask Jesus. But he could have asked Jesus. And this disciple who Jesus loved, I mean, that's not a title that belonged to one person. You know, as if the, of the 12 disciples, minus Judas is carried, of course. And then the spot on, G, on Jesus' chest, that one put there, reserved for John the Apostle. So we all go to heaven, we all want to lean on Jesus' bosom, and then we say, hey, sorry, John, John chomped this place. <laughs> Cannot be, it belonged to all of us. John was more daring, more confident in the love of Jesus. John knew Jesus loved him, and he loved Jesus. And Jesus prayed, that we will all have the revelation of that love. You see, only the Gospel of John brought forth such beauty of Jesus' love. Why four Gospels, one Gospel so different? Because that one Gospel of John, he saw the love of Jesus. He understood the love of Jesus. And he felt the love of Jesus. And he wrote about the love of Jesus for our benefit. And Jesus said, he wants the world to know. He wants your neighbor. He wants all the nations of the world to know that you and I are loved by God. What a privilege. He wants us to be in that position. And he says in verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, do you see that? That the place where I am, that my followers will be where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. Again, love and glory interchange. And that scripture is fulfilled in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 6, when he took us into the heavenly places, seated together with Christ. Why did he take us there in verse 4? Because of his great love. He opened a door for us to enter into the heavenly places. And why? Because verse 7. Why does he want us to experience the heavenly place? Verse 7. That in the ages to come, include the end of this age when the whole planet is finished in all its destiny and the many, many other periods and ages or, or, or whatever comes after. In the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. The heavenly place is the place of Jesus' bosom. Where you and I experience what John experienced on earth in a limited way. And in the spiritual realm, in a wonderful way, we all can be seated in Christ Jesus. And some of you say, 
Wow, how are one me, over one billion of us? How many chairs are there? <laughs> how, how, how do we get seated in how many places in Christ Jesus? Because even now physically, you ought to sit separate. I haven't seen anyone of you sit on top of one another. <laughs> so how do we sit? How, how many thrones are there? At Jesus, how many? Who is at the right side of God? Jesus. Now it says we are seated with Christ, right? So with Christ doesn't mean that behind Christ all the one billion, 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 billion thrones or chairs. No, no, no. With Him. Now some of you will find, wow, how? On top? Beside? Underneath? How do you sleep with Him? Together with Him. Because in the spirit, there is oneness. It's as if you personally are like John the Baptist, seated with Christ, oh, Jesus, on the throne. Well, better don't do it to James. Maybe you do it on this bigger floor. Yeah. You know? <laughs> he's, got, he's more comfortable, more flat. Yeah. So, seated in how many places we Christ Jesus that's a place of love a place where God displays his great wondrous presence of his love to us and as we conclude I want to share how to experience that and to do that I have to share some laws of the spiritual world one of the laws of the spiritual world is that Heaven and the spiritual world is a state of being. It's not just a place. It's a state of being. Now, heaven is a place. And you think of heaven, you think of a distance. Wherever it is, third heaven, wherever, above the sky, wherever. We think in human terms. But in the spiritual world, time, space are all smaller things. It's not time and space that contain God. It's God that contain time and space. So if you were to imagine God, you have a piece of paper, just a rough piece of paper. If you imagine the universe that God makes unto us, it would be uh, like what they say. See, this piece of paper has uh, two sides. Right? It has two sides. But in maths, there's a way they can make the paper into uh, one-sided. This is a bit small to do it. But it, it just has a little curve inside. It's a bit small. Right? Let me make it thinner so you can see it. And uh, all of our universe is contained in God. That's Let's pretend this, in this mathematical figure, it's just a little round. Normally, you would glue it into a circle like this, correct? Make it into a ring. But you just have one fold, and then you glue it on, that, yeah, on one side, and you glue it. This little thing, little piece of paper in this shape has only one side. Looks like two sides. Looks multiple dimension. It has only one side. When you travel along one side, it will go to the other side, comes up to this side, and goes back to the same side. Yes, this piece of paper in this shape has only one side. Only one side. And if you make it a round circular thing, then it's three dimension one side. Everything is the same side. Pretend that the whole universe in our three dimension space, uh, th uh, dimension of space, energy, and time is revealed in this. So we experience the dimensional universe. Wherever we travel in any parts of the universe, we experience it as part of time and space. That whole universe, including all the galaxies as far as the eye can see, as far as any new scientific instrument can measure, discovering more galaxies and nebula and everything else, all that is contained here is inside 
God. What is outside the universe? Like present this is our known universe. What is outside the universe? You know the answer? Love. God is love. The substance of God is love. Love does not, is not limited by time, space, or energy. You notice that even in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5, inside that very verse, you have time and space all compressed together. Because it says, we, when Jesus was risen from the dead, we were raised with Him, correct? Now, you and I were not born 2,000 years ago. That physical event took place about 2,000 years ago in earthly measurement and time. We weren't there, but spiritually, we were in Christ. Can you see that? We were in Christ. So the same question you ask, how do we all sit on the one throne? Have you asked the same question, how did we all get on one, that one cross? Hello there. How big must that cross be to put one million people on that? No, no. The cross don't have to be a big fat cross. Whoa, hang all of us on there. One cross in Christ. So what does the throne room of God look like? Seated in how many places? Because I need to paint a picture for you all. Because you all don't know how to put a picture. So where? Beside, under, left, right, underneath, where? Look at the cross. There's only one cross. Who hung on the cross? One person. One person, correct? One person hung on the cross. But how come every one of us say we were crucified with him? How many billions of people who believe in Christ say we are crucified with Christ? Because spiritually, we don't have to be physically there. Spiritually, when we see him, he and us are one. When he died on the cross, our old nature was died. When he rose from the dead, we are there. Whether you see we are there in him, you're one of those little cells that were glorified. Zoom, you're one part of Jesus. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see that too. You like, you can be the toenail of Jesus. Right? Jesus is the head. We are all the body of Christ. Say, which part are you? Toenail. Which part are you? The eyebrow part to be a sister. Right? Which part? We are all part of Him in Christ. Christ is so huge and big, yet He can be in that. Because in the spiritual, there is only one body. So in the throne room, next to the Father, one throne. One person sitting there. But you know, that person sitting is Christ. But as you look at it very carefully, you are also Him in Him, just as He is in you. It is called in the Spirit, resonance. Because He is us and we are Him. We are one. Him being there already represents us in the Spirit. And we are actually spiritually there. The whole universe of God that God creates, the time dimension is that tiny. Outside of the time dimension is love. That is why when people try to think, where is God? Wrong question. Because the where never applies to God. God is love. How do you draw love? What dimension can you give love? It talks about the width, depth, height, limitless. So this is what our universe looks like. There's God 
and we exist in him the fringe of all the universe is the substance of God God is love and that can grow as much as God wants it to grow and in Christ in the spiritual realm heaven and the spiritual realm is a state of being it's a state of being let me give another really ridiculous example by asking a question how many angels can stand on one pin head <laughs> see I didn't know angels stand on pin head <laughs> How many angels can stand on one pin head? Same as you would ask, how many demons can possess a human being? Remember in the Bible there was a legion. Roughly, if you take those figures they're giving in history, about 6,000, more or less. Is that the maximum? No maximum. See, then it must be very crowded inside. No wonder he went wild and mad. No, oh, 6,000 is like... <laughs> no, no, no. They don't feel space. The answer to the pinhead question... For additional tapes, please write to... <laughs> okay. Infinity. Because space and time are no boundaries. In Christ... The spirit world and heaven is a state of being. Which means that when you think about heaven and your consciousness is heaven, you are in heaven. And heaven is in you. And if heaven is a place, you will see your presence formed form there. As much as heaven's presence is formed in you. So in the spirit world, transportation, if you can call it transportation, from one place to another is by state of being, not by propulsion. Sorry, Newton's law, Einstein's law, all doesn't work there. Those are only physical laws. It's by state of being. Whatever state of being you are, you are. So in heaven, when you on, even while on earth, if you set your mind on things above, Colossians 3, verse 1, on the things above, you are there. Heaven is a state of being. Now, it is also a place. I recognize that. I'm not saying it's not. But I'm talking about different spiritual law that is operating. So, in a sense, when we are in Christ, you are actually there. When your consciousness is in Christ, your you are there in Him, in the secret place of the Most High, in the heavenly place with Him. And every time you meditate upon your position in Christ, upon the position of God's love, you are there. Now, does the reverse happen? Yes. When the enemy comes, and put thoughts and consciousness of sin and condemnation, fear and hell, and all those troubled thoughts dominate you. You actually became heavier, and your state of being is there. If you would have, if you lose your physical body at that stage, you would sink into that level. When we strip ourselves of this physical body and just leave our spirit and soul, your spirit and soul will not remain as it is. 
your spirit and soul will, will move to wherever the state of being is. If your state of being is a heavenly nature, you will move straight into the heavenly place. If your state of being is of the devil and hell, it gets pulled down into hell. If your state of being is on the way near, then it's on the way near. We are what we are in our spirit, which is why we must grow and develop. There are degrees of glory, degrees of grace, degrees of love. Remember I started with the vertical growth, horizontal growth, vertical growth, horizontal growth. We all grow in glory and love and grace and then it flows out through you and you will reach a certain limit and then you have to grow again. So from glory to glory, grace to grace, you're becoming like Christ. As your spirit is strengthened, until one day, Christ is full in you. It is not, it is equal. Just as you are in Christ in a heavenly place, Christ is in us. The two are one. Remember John 17, a prayer. Let me read some scriptures and conclude here. In the book of Colossians, Colossians, it tells us here in Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, it says in verse 27, To them God will to make known what the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you the hope of glory can you see that Christ in us Ephesians we in Christ Christ in us, we in Christ. This is the law of the Spirit. In proportion to how much Christ is in you, in the same direct proportion, you are in Christ in the heavenly place. Equal. So in Ephesians, it tells us in chapter 3 that it comes as our inner man is strengthened. You notice that? As our inner man is strengthened, Christ can dwell more in us and in direct proportion to how much Christ dwells in us, in the same proportion is the same consciousness of you being in Christ. Because you and Christ are one. What a glorious mystery. And that is why for us to experience what it is like to be in a heavenly place is more meditating on Christ in us. Now that helps us. It, the both are the same. I'm trying to tell you both are equal. Heaven is a state of being. Just as Heaven is in you, so are you in heaven. Just as your state of being changed to be heavenly, so even though you're physically here, you are actually there, experiencing all the glories of God. Oh, what a wondrous concept it is. That in a sense, our consciousness is not limited by this time dimension, by this physical dimension. The two are one. Quantum physics gives it a bit. Where there could be two photons, 
When you do something to one light photon here, the other light photon experience the same thing. How is it possible? I illustrate with, for example, you see in this folded picture here. Let me grab another folded picture here. And I show here, pretending that this little light, uh, these white patches here, let me put it around a bit here, around it. Okay. So in my hands, um, you see this white patch here, which is a piece of paper, and this white patch here. And they look like two, for example, little photons. Photons are the light particles. I touch this one, this one gets touched. So you said, how come? Because we are looking from the natural world and from a, our dimensional view, and we see we cannot see how this one is connected to this. But when you take off the invisible veil of the physical dimension of science and physics, of all the laws of physics, and you see the spiritual realm, you will see, hey, it's connected. Can you see that? And we cannot see that because if, for example, this part is hidden from you, and I point the paper this way, you will think they are two separate pieces of paper. But if your eyes were open to a different dimension, and you could zoom down this way, not just see this way, let's say seeing this way is our three-dimensional view, plus time, plus t, x, y, z, plus t, and look this way, you can only see two photons separate. But let's say you could see from a different dimension this, type, this view, and you could say, hey, it's actually the same piece of paper connected. The people are only seeing the ends, the ending part. So that's why quantum physics is limited to the physical law, but when you have another dimension that you're looking at, you say, hey, the two photons are connected. That's why when you touch one, the other is touched. And the interdimensional between them is an invisible realm beyond science. And that is why in direct proportion to us being in Christ up there, it is direct proportion to Christ being in us. And so when you want to be in God, it is the same thing as praying, Oh God, I like to be up there, up there. And you want your spirit to take off. Up there, up there. And it's such a strain. Oh, when will my spirit get taken off? You know? But it's the same as if you're praying and yielding Christ dwelling in you. See the difference? And that's why when I teach people about the spirit realm, the gift of the spirit through 1 Corinthians 12 can take you into the spirit realm. But there's a way in which you could allow Christ to dwell in you and your state of being changed. Where your state of being is equal to that of the heavenly realm, to that degree, you are actually experiencing that realm. Which would mean, like the little photon, here and here, I could be here. Now, let's point to fiber optics, right? Some of you are familiar. Today, they use fiber optics. If you look at fiber optics from the end, what do you see? Light coming up. And in fiber optics, the other side is the same light going through. Of course, being human is not perfect. But let's say that it's perfect. Everything that you see on this, show on this side should be on this side. And so even though you seem to be like in two places, your physical body is down here in Christ in the heavenly place, everything that happens here, let's say this is a fiber optic cable, every light that comes here, chick, 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 comes here, chick, 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 chick. everything that transforms here got more light, chick, 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 chick. it's transformed here, chick, 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 chick. of course, minus the chick, chick sound. <laughs> so you don't have Christ coming to you, chick, 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 chick. you in Christ, chick, 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 chick. right, okay, minus that sound. <laughs> I know. So, you have the same experience. Now, here's what I show you. In fiber optics, whatever is here, no matter how far it goes, of course, today they have optical enhancers all along the way. And when you reach to the other end, 
optimally is supposed to give the same strength signal. That's what they aim at. So that the fiber optic can be in Singapore and I transmit a signal or a picture. By all means, that same picture should be there. Same, same light, same frequency that I transmit in light waves to produce a picture on that side. And because light is much faster than electrons, it goes shoo, at the speed of light on the other side. Of course, it travels slightly slower in, in, in solids, I know that, but generally, very fast. So, when you're here, your spirit man is here on the earth, you meditate on Christ. You're in the spirit because if you're connected to the same level, which means on your inside, when the presence of heaven is in your life, your spirit man has five senses, spiritual sense of sight, spiritual sense of hearing, spiritual sense of touch, spiritual sense of smell, and a spiritual sense of taste. Your spirit man, through the quote-unquote spiritual fiber optics, sensing everything in heaven, one in Christ, you could hear and see things in the spirit. Can you see that? And sometimes because we are new to it, and our spiritual eyes are, are not open yet, like little babies when they're born, their eyes cannot focus yet. What do babies do? They feel. Right? Babies can feel hot, cold, warm, food. So like little babies, the first thing you all feel Christ in you, we in Christ. The presence of His love. That's fine. Develop the sense of touch. And then some of you might see lights here, lights there, but your eyes cannot focus like a little baby. But as you keep on in that place and worship God and meditate, some of those lights slowly become clearer and you begin to see it take shape and form and it might become an angel, a picture, a picture of paradise. And hey, I can see, I can see. Yes, you can. Congratulations. <laughs> Your spiritual eyes have opened. And you're seeing the spiritual realm. And then you can hear. Your ears can hear sounds in heaven. And they are not natural sounds. As far as you're concerned, your five physical senses, nothing. But your spiritual senses are alive and you experience God. And that's what prayer life is like when you enter into God and pray. And you experience those things as you learn to enjoy that place of the heavenly place in Christ. Because it is a place that God connected you and I with, with the spiritual fiber optics to experience all of Christ in heaven just as Christ is in us and your spiritual life will increase and you begin to develop your sense of sight your sense of hearing your sense of touch and you say how useful can this be oh you have no idea the spiritual realm can peer into the future and see things to come the spiritual realm can peer into the past and understand events that you couldn't see before the spiritual realm can peer into different dimensions and place because the physical is but a small object from the spiritual realm of point. The X-ray of the spiritual realm can analyze the physical millions and millions fold. A complicated problem in the physical realm, huh, nothing in the spiritual realm. Trying to get a piece of music or worship, compose a song, huh, the spiritual realm, billions of it, of tunes and sound. Physical, all they struggle. Wisdom, ideas, things to do, keys to healing, keys to victory. It's up there. The riches of his storehouse is up there. It's in the heavenly place. And it's proportional to him being in us. As we learn to yield to this wonderful sense of God's love and yield to what it means to be in the heavenly place, God will magnify and multiply our spiritual life in a higher dimension. Let's pray.